This week on Christian World News, ruthless dictator goes down. For decades, Sudan's Omar Bashir waged a brutal war against Christians and other minorities. Now he's out of power and the military is in control. Plus, what started as a classroom meeting under a tree is now an eight-acre school, giving hope and a future to Rwandan children and their families. And the European nation where medical ethics are overtaken by a culture of death and doctors are taking lives without the family's consent. to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. And I'm Wendy Griffith. We begin in Africa, where Sudan's military has overthrown President Omar al-Bashir, and it has taken charge of the country for the next two years. The move came after nearly four months of protests against Bashir's rule. Sudan's defense minister made the announcement on television. He says free and fair elections will be held in two years. He also declared a state of emergency for the next three months. The military has also suspended the constitution and closed the borders and airspace. That's right. This news has special relevance for Christians and other minorities in the country, particularly those in the Nuba Mountains who were targeted for attacks and slaughter by the Bashir regime for decades. Gary Lane has this report from 2015. For more than two decades, Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir has waged war against the people of the Nubas and South Kordofan state. Muslims and Christians alike have resisted his efforts to Arabize and Islamize them. They believe he sees them as infidels. He wants to kill them and seize their oil. Sudanese Christian human rights activist Namia Ibrahim Shaloka says many Americans mistakenly believe that fighting ended in the Nubas when South Sudan gained independence nearly three years ago. He says the opposite is true. The war against his people is escalating. Every day is daily air bombardment, destroying the school, even the facilities, the health centers, churches and everything. The Nubans were alarmed by Bashir's new preferred method of attack, parachute bombs. Parachute bombs are more deadly because they're much quieter and less noticeable when they fall from the sky. It's just like uh, totally focusing to destroy the life of the people and they target even the civilians, they don't focus in. Uh, anything else. This is the situation. Religious freedom advocate Tina Ramirez of the nonprofit group Hardwired says Sudanese President Bashir is at the heart of every Sudan conflict, from Darfur to the Nuba Mountains and the Blue Nile. The conflict is not between Muslims and Christians, it's between Bashir and his version of Islam that's extremely oppressive and everybody else in Sudan, and that includes South Sudan. So he's constantly um, pitting groups off of each other and instigating problems even in South Sudan. The International Criminal Court has issued a warrant against Bashir for war crimes and crimes against humanity. So far, the Sudanese president has avoided arrest. Gary Lane is with us now. He's made many trips to the Sudan. Gary, the military is now in charge there. Is yes. this a good thing? Well, it's a good thing that uh, the people are rid of Omar al-Bashir, the Islamist despot that has ruled that country for 30 years and has tried to Islamize the people of the south and the Nuba Mountains, and who is wanted, by the way, by the International Criminal Court for committing war crimes against the people of Darfur. Yeah. But remember, Wendy, for 20 years, he tried to uh, commit jihad against the Christians of South Sudan. He finally relented, and they have their own country now. But uh, two million people were killed over a 20-year period. Why did Bashar target Christians and others for genocide? Well, Bashar, uh, it's all about power. It's all about Islamizing his country and controlling it. Remember, as soon as he came to power in 1989, he uh, imposed Sharia law. So women had to cover their heads. Uh, you know all about Sharia law. You talk about it regularly here on this show. Uh, so that's one reason. The other reason is Christians love democracy. Mm. And they serve God. They don't right. serve the state. He wanted them to serve the state. He viewed them as infidels. Could Bashir 
possibly face the International Criminal Court for his many crimes? The general who heads up the Transitional Council right now, it's a uh, military transitional council, uh, says that, uh, no, he will not be extradited to the International Criminal Court. He said any uh, trial or anything, any charges against him will come from inside Sudan. Interesting. Gary Lane, thank you so much for Certainly. that. George? Ryan Boyette is a 15-year missionary to Sudan who served in the Nuba Mountains. Right now, he's living in North Carolina and joins us by Skype. Uh, what impact might Bashir's removal have uh, on the Nubas and in Sudan in general? Well, the people of Nuba are extremely excited that Omar Bashir has been taken out of power. I mean, this is a guy who has burned their villages down, bombed them for years and years. Uh, the past eight years have been in war in which the Sudan armed forces have been have been killing people, um, destruction of churches and hospitals. So the fact that this man is being removed is is a weight off their shoulders. But at the same time, with the military rule, there's they don't expect much difference right now. But the people in uh, Khartoum that have been protesting since December are also not happy with the decision of the army uh, coming into power. So people are still protesting up until uh, today, even after the announcement and even after Bashir has left. Yeah. Uh, you lived, uh, by the way, in the Nuba Mountains and reported on the attacks there. That got you uh, targeted by al-Bashir's uh, regime. Tell us about that. Uh, that's exactly right. I, uh, I would go to the front lines, report on the conflict and, and what was taking place. And as a result, in the spotlight that was uh, put upon me uh, for that, uh, the Sudan Air Force uh, dropped six bombs in a line in my, on, on top of my house. Um, I, I jumped in a hole. Uh, the shrapnel flew over me. Uh, my wife was at a friend's house. Uh, my wife is Sudanese, and she was pregnant with our son. And when those bombs fell, uh, the third bomb was near her. She hid behind a rock. Uh, the rock protected her. God protected her through that rock. And the shrapnel ricocheted off the rock. And uh, as a result, we named our son when he was born, uh, Eben, uh, for Rock of Help, uh, because God protected us that day. Wow. Uh, how is the church doing today in the Nuba? And how, we, how can we pray for them? The, ch the church has an extremely strong faith in the Nuba Mountains. They have undergone persecution for years and years, just tremendous stories of their history of, of pastors being killed and, and drugged behind cars and churches destroyed. And that makes the church's faith strong. I have seen churches destroyed, and the very next day the people are there rebuilding them. Um, they have tremendous faith. So please pray that they will have a time of peace that they will be able to focus on learning about Christ and that they will stop having to deal with the bombings and destruction of of, uh, of their villages and their, their church buildings. Yeah, we have less than 30 seconds here. Ryan, tell us real quickly about the, your ministry to the people of Nubas, and, and can you go back? The church has told us that we are they're losing the generation because of the war, that they need education. They need uh, the new generation coming up, the children, to learn how to read and write. And that's why we started our organization called To Move Mountains. And you can see it at tomovemountains.org. And we need help uh, because the people of Nuba don't have much help there. And so we want to provide them with a good education so that they will be able to understand God's word and read his word. Okay, Ryan, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for coming on the show and all that you're doing to proclaim the name of Christ in Sudan. Thanks, sir. Thank you. God bless. God bless you. Joe. A fascinating interview. Yeah, it really is. Amazing. Incredible. Well, 25 years ago in Rwanda, 800,000 people died in genocidal attacks. That lasted 100 days. That horrific event moved one Colorado woman to leave the comforts of her own home to help bring healing to the country. Contributing correspondent Stephanie Riggs traveled to Rwanda to show us how that sacrifice is transforming lives for Christ. What William and Kavini do not have in material things, they more than make up for in spirit. An enduring spirit that inspires them to walk six miles to school and back, as they have done for the past seven years. Their school is an oasis of hope, not far from the capital city of Kigali. Aptly named Hope Haven, Rwanda. There wasn't a single school 
in probably a 15 mile radius. But that didn't stop founder Susan Holleran, who remembers early classes under this giant acacia tree. But what you have to imagine is not only did we have this tree, but all of this was bush. We had six foot tall grass. William and Cavini were there from the beginning. You were under the tree. Yes. Seven years ago. Yes. When we are under the tree, we are not very happy because it was not looking nice. And now the buildings are very big and there's no rain falling on us. I really had a big submitting moment with the Lord and just asked him to really take charge of my life. Excitement is an understatement as local workers and parents of students join together for a common vision, a school, a community, a family. The last five years, we've erected 38,000 square feet. Every worker is from our immediate community. So they have learned bricklaying skills, they've learned cement skills, and they've learned roofing skills, all the skills that it takes to actually get a job somewhere else. That tree still stands at Hope Haven's entrance, a constant reminder that even small seeds, when nurtured, can grow into greatness. I want to become a doctor. I want to be the, the manager of the World Bank. I wish to be a teacher when I grow up. And if national test scores are any indication, they'll be whatever they want to be. Because every student here taking that test scored in the top 3%, making Hope Haven the top performing school in all of Rwanda. <laughs> yes, it's true. Okay. <laughs> can you believe it? I can. You guys are the smartest cookies in the whole country. <laughs> cookies? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think we are cookies. <laughs> To fully appreciate the significance of the school, you must understand the violent history of Rwanda. Just 25 years ago, the families of these children were aligned on either side of a mortal combat, a state-sponsored genocide where the ruling Hutus slaughtered nearly one million people of the Tutsi minority over a 100-day period. Every day, Hope Heaven is bringing a change and transforming so many families in this community. I raise a banner to the Lord and glorify God. He blessed us with someone to love and care for us. She didn't know us, but gave us everything to make our lives better. We're educating the kids, serving them two meals. They're here from seven until four. The parents are working during this earning and learning programs. Where do you get all the money to do this, Susan? It's remarkable. That is private donations. I get nervous about it, but you know, the anxiety stops because we have a God of abundance. Allowing William, Cavini, and more than 650 other children to dream big. I don't know if my dreams will come true, but I want to be a president. A what? A president. A president of Rwanda? Yes. I could beautiful. totally see that That's little awesome. guy becoming president. Yeah, no kidding. What a oh, great story. Great Thank story. you so much, Stephanie Riggs, for that. The school administrator is asking for prayer as she now plans to build a high school for her students. That's awesome. And you can learn more at our website, cbnnews.com. Coming up, the country where assisted suicide masquerades as medical care even for non-terminal cases. Now, some angry victims who have lost loved ones, well, they are fighting back. CBN presents The I Wills of God, your path to overcoming fear and anxiety. We're going to talk about some of the incredible promises God has made to his children. In Pat Robertson's newest teaching, you'll discover the I wills of God. I will rescue him, protect him, answer him, be with him in trouble, deliver him, honor him, satisfy him with long life, show him my salvation, and see amazing stories of God's promises in action. What I felt was loved and treasured. God spared my life twice in three days. The good Lord had given me a second chance. Break free from stress and despair. The Lord doesn't want you to live in fear, but to know the rewards given to those who love God. Call 1-800-700-7000 or visit cbn.com. The I Wills of God, your path to overcoming fear and anxiety.
Remember for a moment what it was like to be a child. You believed every story you were told. You saw a world full of endless possibilities. What stories will the world's orphaned and at-risk children believe? We believe the Bible tells the only story truly worth believing. We believe that every child should have the opportunity to dream, the chance to take challenges and turn them into possibilities, the chance to stand on the promises of God, to recognize their place in the greatest story ever told. They have their whole lives ahead of them. Theirs is a world of endless possibilities. They are looking for a story to believe. We will tell them that story. Will you join us? Welcome back to Christian World News. When Belgium legalized euthanasia, critics warned it was headed down a dangerous path. Now the European nation may have hit bottom. As my colleague Dale Ho reports from Brussels, medical ethics are being overtaken by a culture of death. Belgium has long been famous for food, like waffles and chocolate. But now it's becoming famous for something else. Belgium has one of the most liberal euthanasia laws in the world. You could end your life here by simply telling a doctor that you have unbearable physical or mental suffering. Terminally ill children of any age can receive a lethal injection if their parents agree with the child's wishes. Tom Mortier's mother was euthanized in 2012 because even though physically healthy, she was said to be incurably depressed. My mother, who was physically healthy because of her mental problems, received a lethal injection from an oncologist. It was done without his or his family's knowledge. He was only told by the hospital the day after his mother was killed. My mother had several mental problems. She had to cope with depression throughout her life. She was treated for years by a psychiatrist. And the contact between us was broken. A year later, she received a lethal injection. Mortier filed a complaint with the medical board and then with a prosecutor, but was turned away. With the help of Alliance Defending Freedom, Mortier appealed his case to the European Court of Human Rights, which has agreed to hear it. His legal counsel is Robert Clark. Like, how can a physically healthy woman who has struggled with depression, who's had good days and who's had bad days, how can someone like that be euthanized in a democratic Western country uh, without the family members even being aware that it was happening? Something that makes this case even more disturbing is that the doctor who euthanized the woman sits on the very government body that is supposed to oversee the euthanasia law. The doctor, Vims Distelmans, who some have compared to the late Dr. Jack Kevorkian, once led a euthanasia tour of Auschwitz under the theme, Death with Dignity. Distelmans is co-chairman of Belgium's Euthanasia Commission. We have a significant conflict of interest where someone is essentially acting as judge and executioner um, in his own cases. When Distelman's commission did nothing after a dementia patient was euthanized without asking to die, one doctor quit the panel, writing that he did not want to be part of a committee that deliberately violates the law. There are now more than 13,000 euthanasia cases that this commission has reviewed. And in those 13,000, I'm aware of now one which has been referred to the prosecutor. As ethical safeguards have fallen in Belgium, some say killing has become a part of medical care. We began to offer death as a medical solution even for non-terminal cases. It is a problem. I have heard about people who were offered euthanasia even though they were not even considering it. The types of conditions, the, the things that would qualify someone for euthanasia are being pushed further and further out. In the most recent reporting period, there were euthanasias carried out on children as young as 17, um, 11 and 9. The supply of euthanasia stirs the demand. What you see is that uh, for an increasing amount of people, euthanasia becomes the default way to die. When we find someone who's requesting to die, who's standing on the proverbial edge of a bridge, and instead of trying to talk them down, the, the state is pushing them off. 
Clark says Belgium is now the ultimate cautionary tale for any nation that wants to legalize euthanasia. And I think we have to ask ourselves, is that the kind of society that we want to live in? Or do we want to live in a society with laws that say that vulnerable life should be protected and that all life, no matter what stage and no matter the health of the person, has dignity and value? Dale Hurd, CBN News, Brussels. Thanks, Dale. Up next, amazing discoveries in the Holy Land, pointing to key figures in the Bible and giving us a look at life in ancient Jerusalem. It's about the competition. I kind of put that pressure on myself, and I think people had expectations. It's about overcoming. We use this phrase all the time, keep chopping, keep practicing hard. It's about going the distance. You know, I think as a father, it's my job, you know, to lead, just be the best husband and father I can be. Watch Going the Distance with Sean Brown, Saturday night at 7.30 on the CBN News Channel. Superbook fans, here's something else you'll love. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's the new Superbook Bible app. <laughs> it's packed with games, activities, and Superbook episodes that you can watch for free. Oh no! There's trivia, a fun daily devotional, and answers to your Bible questions. Plus, an easy to understand Bible the whole family will enjoy. You can even create your own Superbook character. Ta da! Come uh, sorry, pardon me, sorry, excuse me. Ouch! Are you getting this? Earn super points to win daily prizes too. And so much more! <sighs> Time to get back to my adventures. See you soon! It's the new Superbook Bible app. Free downloads on iTunes, Google Play, and Amazon. Discover the I wills of God. I will rescue him, protect him, answer him, be with him in trouble, deliver him, honor him, satisfy him with long life, show him my salvation. What I felt was loved and treasured. God spared my life twice in three days. The good Lord had given me a second chance. Call 1-800-700-7000 or visit CBN.com. The I wills of God, the latest teaching from Pat Robertson. Hey, welcome back to Christian World News. Israeli archaeologists have made two rare discoveries in and around the city of David. They point to historical figures mentioned in the Bible. All right. Well, Chris Mitchell shows us what makes these new finds so special. The discoveries came from here, the Givati excavation. It's part of the ancient city of David, where King David set up his capital 3,000 years ago. Israeli archaeologists made the discoveries in this structure, where they found evidence of a big fire they believe dates back to 586 B.C. when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. Here you can still see the ash from the fire. The discoveries are an ancient bula and a seal. This is the bula. A bula is actually a tiny piece of clay that was attached to letters or jars in order to make sure that no one opened them without noticing. The bula bore a special name. And this one says, To Netan Melech, the servant of the king. Le Netan Melech, Eved HaMelech. Now, the name Netan Melech is known from the Bible, from uh, the Book of Kings. While archaeologists can't say for certain this Netan Melech is the one mentioned in the Bible, Dr. Gerbovich from Hebrew University says the evidence is compelling. First, the name Netan Melech, which is rare. Second, the period. We're talking about the mid 7th century BCE, King Josiah. And third, the fact that we have the title. So Netanelech was someone who was close to the king. For the archaeologists, the finds are like touching Jerusalem's history. This is very impressive for me, not only because of the history, because this is actually a snapshot for the history that happened here. 2,600 years ago. These discoveries shed more light on ancient Jerusalem and paint a more complete picture of King David's city. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Givati Excavation, the City of David. Wow, thanks Chris, fascinating. For more stories like this, just go to our website, cbnnews.com. We'll be right back. 
as the world watches from the outside. It's a big diplomatic tug of war here in the Middle East. Go inside the story with Jerusalem Dateline. Israeli archaeologists are talking about a discovery that could change the thinking about the Temple Mount. Join CBN Jerusalem Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell and get the biblical perspective on the events shaping the world. It's what starts in Israel then ends up going to other places. Watch Jerusalem Dateline Friday night at 9.30 on the CBN News Channel. Orphan's Promise is committed to loving and serving at-risk children, to helping keep families together, and to creating opportunities for strong and sustainable communities around the world. We're working in over 60 countries around the world, and with your help, we can do even more. There's an old African proverb I love that says, if you want to run fast, run alone. But if you want to run far, run together. At Orphan's Promise, we want to run far so we can touch the lives of as many orphaned and vulnerable children as possible. But we don't want to go alone. We're out to change the world, one child, one family, one community at a time. Will you join us? Meet the pastors who are preaching the gospel in a fresh, fearless way. I'm Roberto Torres Cedillo. Join me each week for Next Gen Voices. And watch God transform a generation. Well, finally this week, Krishna's father took him to Hindu festivals to pray to God. But Krishna says he didn't find God until he went to an after-school program where the teachers were showing episodes of CBN's Superbook. Take a look. Nine-year-old Krishna still remembers how he went with his dad to the Hindu festivals and shrines to pray. When I was in kindergarten, I asked my dad, who is God? I remember saying some Hindu prayers and pouring water on the offering, but I was confused. I asked myself, what does God really look like? Does he look like the statues? Then Krishna went to an after-school program near his home. That's where he watched the CBN Superbook episode, The Fiery Furnace. They were ordered to worship the king statue, but they refuse. They believe that God will protect them. What happened next astounded his teacher. I remember Krishna suddenly raised his hand and asked, does that mean that we shouldn't be worshipping statues or idols? So I told him that we must only worship the Lord Jesus who created heaven and earth. After receiving the answer, Krishna made a decision. I raised my hand because I wanted to receive Jesus as Savior in my heart. Krishna now loves to share about Superbook and Jesus with his family, and he's praying for his dad and grandparents to know Jesus too. I am so grateful that I learned that we must only worship the Lord Jesus. Thank you for sharing Superbook with me. Isn't he just Fantastic. precious? Yeah, beautiful. Sweetheart. Great. Well, well, folks, that is it for this week's edition of Christian World News. Until next week, from all of us here, goodbye and God bless you. <laughs>